Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I wanted to welcome you to the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library. My name is Francis Buckley, and I'm the interim director of the library. And I'm very, very pleased to welcome you today um, for a program in honor of Black History Month. The library has been putting on a series of programs throughout the city at uh, this library and branch libraries. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm pleased that you're here for this, this event. Um, as many of you know, uh, Black History Month is an annual observance that celebrates the past and present achievements of African Americans. Um, in 1926, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, founder of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, proposed the establishment of Black History Week. He chose the second week of February because it commemorates the birthdays of two great Americans who had a great impact on the black community, Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. It was in 1976 that the week-long observance was uh, expanded to a whole month. But on behalf of the library and our co-sponsor, the museum, the world's first interactive museum of news, um, I welcome you to this Black History Month program. Today's program features Lieutenant Commander Wesley A. Brown, the first African American to graduate from the U.S. Naval Academy. Sharing the stage with Mr. Brown is Dr. Robert Schneller, author of Breaking the Color Barrier, the U.S. Naval Academy's first black midshipman and the struggle for racial equality. This book in part describes some of the difficulties Mr. Brown endured. In 2005, it won the prestigious Richard A. Leapold Leppold Award uh, from the Organization of American Historians, the largest learned society devoted to the study of American history. Serving as our moderator for this event is um, Frank Bond, who is a producer at the museum. The program director at the organization, Richard Foster, will introduce Mr. Bond. Very briefly, Mr. Foster is a frequent host of the organization's webcasts and has more than 20 years of television and video experience. Prior to joining the museum in 1998, he served as director of television and video productions at RF Communications. Earlier at the Labor Institute of Public Affairs, he worked as executive editor of a one-hour television special titled Working in the 1990s, which won a 1993 Emmy Award for the best location documentary for the National Capital Region. Mr. Foster has also served as producer at USA Today on TV and produced documentaries and public affairs programming at the WXIA TV station in Atlanta. In 1989, Gannett Broadcast Station named him Executive of the Year. Uh, Rich has also been kind enough to be the moderator at other library programs, um, several at, uh, for Black History Week, but also um, other, other events at the library. So I'd like to first welcome Mr. Foster, who will introduce Mr. Bond, who will introduce our speaker. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> Thank you, Fran, and good afternoon. I'm going to keep it very brief. I am primarily here, since we have a captive audience, to give you the museum commercial. Uh, how many of you have heard about the museum? Hopefully some of you have. Okay. Well, we're about to move into town, and next year, finally, uh, right down the street at, at uh, 6th Street and Pennsylvania Avenue, we plan to be neighbors. And it's always great to be here at the library. We have had just a wonderful partnership with the D.C. Public Library branches over the past uh, four or five years, and we look forward to continuing that even stronger relationship once we're here in the district. Uh, just for a little background, for those of you who don't know, the museum is the largest operating program of the Freedom Forum. The Freedom Forum is a foundation dedicated to free press, free speech, and free spirit. We have three key priorities. The museum, which we just gave you the commercial for, uh, First Amendment uh, issues, and diversity in the nation's newsroom. We really feel that our media best represents us when the faces in those newsrooms look like the communities that they serve. So that's the museum commercial. So now on to this evening's program, which is really exciting. Uh, and um, uh, we are uh, looking forward to hear from uh, retired Naval Lieutenant Commander Wesley Brown, the first 
African-American graduate at the U.S. Naval Academy, and the author of the book, Mr. Ann Robert Schneller. Uh, it's a story of courage and determination in the face of obstacles, but it's also a, a story of promise and hope. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn the program over to our moderator, Frank Bond. Uh, Frank Bond is, as Fran mentioned, a producer at the museum. Uh, prior to that, though, for many of you are from the Washington area, Frank was a reporter and anchor man at, at Channel 9, WUSA, for about 10 years. Prior to that, uh, Frank covered national news for the company that owns Channel 9, the Gannett Corporation, for its entire broadcast group. And I first met Frank a long time ago at WBAL-TV back in the early 80s, where we worked together. So uh, without further ado, let me turn the program over to Frank Bond. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. It really was a long time ago, but some days it doesn't feel that long ago. I'm sure, Commander Brown, you have the same feelings about your time in Annapolis. It's a pleasure for me to return here once again for our annual Black History Month program and once again have the privilege to spend some time with a man whose life and achievements can be an inspiration to us all. I want to say at the outset that the D.C. Public Library is listed in the acknowledgment chapter of Dr. Schneller's book. And it's important for me to make that acknowledgement here to remind our audience that libraries do, in fact, contain that magic that's available and accessible as each of us charts our, our course through life. Robert Schneller is the man who introduced the world to Wesley Brown in the book Breaking the Color Barrier. Dr. Schneller is an official historian in the contemporary history branch of the Naval Historical Center. Welcome to you. This afternoon, as we talk, we're going to look to you to kind of set the historical context and landscape, the background against which Commander Brown sailed his journey through the Naval Academy. It's really important for us to understand that, West, uh, that Annapolis, the Naval Academy, was trying to achieve what it was, was having the problems it was, as a reflection of what was going on in society at large. It was 1949 that the Academy graduated its first black midshipman, and it's an honor to welcome you here today, Commander Brown. What can you tell us of that day, first of all? Let's talk about graduation day. Did you all throw your caps in the air back then? Yes. Did you throw your cap in the air, and what were you feeling standing there? It was such a relief that I thought the hat was going to go to the moon. I threw it so hard certainly was one of the uh, most interesting and wonderful days of my life. And I left there, went to Howard University's graduation, uh, where Dr. Ralph Bunch and Madam Pondit received honorary degrees, and uh, I just felt good all day. I had a chance to talk to two of the most interesting people in the world. And not too long after that, I attended a luncheon in my honor out in Chicago, and I sat next to a gentleman named Jesse Owens, and he asked me for my autograph. Wow. wow. So, so uh, I was feeling pretty good. June week of a lifetime. Of course, graduation is also called commencement. And as you left the grounds of the Naval Academy, what was your anticipation as you began your career as a naval officer, and to what extent did your experience at Annapolis prepare you for all you found in the real world of the U.S. Navy? It prepared me quite a bit in terms of leadership, in terms of challenge. I felt that I could take on just about any assignment that I could be given, but I also became a professional engineer and a member of the Navy Civil Engineer Corps. And as such, I participated in many very interesting projects throughout the world, particularly the Philippines, Guantanamo, Cuba, and the Antarctic as examples. Um, I moved around about every two years. Uh, that was something that wasn't very pleasant for naval officers or naval enlisted men because housing was difficult. It was difficult to find places to eat. Sometimes you couldn't get the gas stations to sell you gas, even if you were in uniform. 
But uh, over the years, these conditions improved with legislation such as voting rights acts and the um, public accommodations acts and others. Uh, so uh, things did improve, but uh, it was certainly a challenge having three youngsters uh, and a wife uh, and going across country 11 times. This is a very long story, the integration of the Naval Officer Corps through the academy. Dr. Schneller, Wesley Brown was the first black midshipman to graduate, but certainly not the first to enter, not by a long shot. That was James Webster Smith in 1870. What I found interesting, and what I think is informative to our audience today, is the way in which what was possible inside the Naval Academy was often shaped by what was going on in America beyond the borders of Annapolis. And that as you take a look at race relations in this country from Reconstruction up through the Jim Crow era, I want to know if you can really give us kind of a comparison of, of what was happening uh, when James Webster Smith was there in 1870 and as race relations actually dived to their lowest and what happened during the Jim Crow era just before World War II, just before the, the time that Commander uh, Brown entered? Well, the Reconstruction era, which followed the Civil War, has been described as a glorious failure. Uh, glorious because African Americans almost achieved uh, uh, political equality with, with the majority, uh, and a failure because uh, the white majority had a backlash and reduced African Americans to a state resembling slavery up until the, the Civil Rights era really got rolling, the civil rights movement really got rolling in the 1950s and 1960s. And it was, uh, Smith was the first African American appointed to West Point. It was James I'm Conyers You're right. who, was, who was appointed to uh, the Naval Academy. And he was appointed by an African American congressman from South Carolina. And this would, would have been uh, utterly impossible for South Carolina to elect a, a black congressman before the Civil War. But this was possible during Reconstruction, before, night, or before 1877. And so uh, it seems that this congressman, whose name was Elliot, handpicked Conyers to go to the Naval Academy uh, to break the color barrier there and become the first African-American graduate. Mostly what happened with Conyers and the two that followed him during Reconstruction, one in 1872, one in 1873, and one in 1874, was that their white classmates uh, physically attacked them and, and silenced them. The physical attacks occurred uh, mostly at, at the hands of white classmates who had failed exams and were going to be thrown out of the Naval Academy anyway. So they vented their frustration with that and their racist impulses on these African-American midshipmen. Uh, we don't know what happened to James Conyers. The second African-American midshipman uh, was named Alonzo McLennan, and he went on to become a physician in Charleston. Uh, the third African-American midshipman from the 1870s, Henry Baker, went on to become a, a, a patent clerk at the U.S. Patent Office. So at least in the latter two cases, they were qualified academically to get through. Conyers was born in slavery and didn't start his education till age 10. Um, after the so-called Compromise of 1877, uh, Jim Crow laws became the law of the land. It became illegal, for example, for African-American uh, factory workers to accept a, a ladle of water from the same bucket as whites in factories in the South. And it was in this atmosphere that uh, perhaps up to two dozen African-Americans were appointed to the Naval Academy between uh, Reconstruction and uh, the end of World War II, but none except for three, or, or I should say two, none of those were accepted, mostly because the, the Naval Academy doctors, it seems, fudged eye tests so that uh, most African-American appointees were not ever admitted. When uh, an African-American congressman from Chicago appointed African-American midshipmen in the 1930s, James Johnson and George Trivers, both of whom were native Washingtonians, by the way. They got into the Naval Academy, but were railroaded out. 
And this time it was with the collusion uh, of the administration. The administration more or less looked the other way while uh, upperclassmen, in this case seniors and juniors, tried to and succeeded in running these gentlemen out. And uh, mostly by giving them demerits for uh, things that they didn't do. Commander Brown, you grew up during the era of Jim Crow segregation, and yet you did not let that limit your aspirations, your, your personal goals. How were you able to, to nurture them, which I might point out in the beginning were steering you towards West Point, even before you ended up at the Naval Academy, but, but how does one set those high goals and, and a high level of personal achievement against the, the, the information of odds of overwhelming against your success? Well, I believe that growing up in Washington and attending the segregated public schools of Washington was a great asset for me because our teachers believed in us, our military instructors in the high school Cadet Corps felt we were capable of West Point, Naval Academy, or any other place we wanted to go. And most of my classmates did go to college and some of the top colleges in the country. We had a pretty good reputation. Uh, and I did leave Dunbar High School, go to Howard University, another all-black school. So I was well prepared academically to take on academics at the Naval Academy, and I was in the top half of my class. If I hadn't received so many demerits, I think I might have stood a little higher. But the fact that we had almost constant daily contact with the black congressman, and my appointment came from Congressman Adam Clayton Powell, the second congressman of the 20th century who had just been elected from New York. Uh, the idea was that he was looking for someone to appoint to the Naval Academy. And through a friend of the family, I found this out and decided to go for the Naval Academy rather than West Point because I felt it was a greater challenge. And we had been taught that we could do just about anything. I think that self-confidence is what you have to have to be successful in some of these firsts. And that's something which I don't believe I would have uh, learned in a school that wasn't all black. We at the museum, of course, focus on the role of the press to help shape U.S. history. And Dr. Schnelling, I want to talk a little bit about what was going on during World War II. Here you have African Americans serving in the military, uh, and you have the press writing about them. And this happened to be uh, an era of a robust black press, uh, more so than, than other times in U.S. history. Talk to me a little bit about the uh, legacy of achievement and service from the Tuskegee Airmen, you know, all the way up to, to Doris Miller and, and the attack on Pearl Harbor. And then the double V program of the Pittsburgh Courier newspaper to talk about victory in Europe and victory at home where once again Jim Crow segregation was standing in the way of blacks achieving uh, even as they were serving their country and dying overseas. Well, African Americans served in the Army and the Navy in every American war. Uh, there was uh, policies in both services of exclusion and segregation that tended to be relaxed somewhat during wartime because uh, of the needs of the nation. They, they seemed to be able to overcome prejudice just enough to fill the ranks with African Americans rather than deny the services 10% of the population. Now during the 1930s, there was a, a newspaper called the Pittsburgh Courier, which was based in Pittsburgh, but it was an African American newspaper with a national circulation. And the editor, whose name was Robert Van, 
wanted to launch a campaign and, and did in fact launch a campaign through his newspaper to integrate the armed services. The idea was that if African Americans were given an equal opportunity to serve in the armed services, they could then demonstrate that they had the same abilities to become officers and do the same things in the military that whites could do. And therefore, they could go on and argue with an even higher moral stance for equal rights in society. And uh, this campaign, uh, as I said, was started in the 1930s. And in the 1940s, with World War II going on, it was transformed into the Double Victory Campaign, or Double V Campaign. And uh, Double V meant African Americans would win a victory over fascism abroad, Hitler's master racism, and thereby be able to gain victory over racism at home, with the idea that if African Americans could serve in the military, uh, they could help defeat fascism, and then they deserve full equal rights at home. This, of course, didn't quite happen, but there was an awful lot of uh, political support for African Americans mobilized by the black press. And some would argue uh, that the black press and other pressers sort of embarrassed FDR to take action to open up the armed services to the African Americans uh, to a greater extent. In the Navy, for example, in 1942, all an African American could hope to be was a mess steward. Uh, essentially an officer's servant. And by the end of the war, because of uh, political pressures resulting from the black press and also because there were uh, a number of people in the Roosevelt administration who wanted equal opportunity to take place, at least in theory, all billets in the Navy were open to African Americans. In practice, of course, uh, it took until the 70s for this to actually occur. But in, in, in policy, as it was written, the Navy was integrated in 1945. So Commander Brown, as you enter the Naval Academy in 1945, what was your expectation and what was the reality that you found awaiting you there in Annapolis? Well, my expectation obviously was to graduate. And I had some good reasons to feel that way I was dating the sister of a recent West Point graduate, black. I had a couple of friends whom I knew pretty well at West Point. And as a ninth grader, I had met cadet James Fowler, who graduated from West Point in 1941. And all of these gentlemen had been officers in the high school cadet corps uh, at Dunbar High School, my high school. I was the cadet colonel, and the fellow who preceded me as colonel was at Dartmouth and had an appointment to West Point. At that time, we thought that perhaps we would be roommates at West Point. But there was no doubt in my mind that since these fellows had accomplished, at least I had role models knew how to seek a West Point nomination. And until Powell indicated uh, that an appointment would be available for the Naval Academy, I was headed for West Point. Uh, incidentally, not only did Edward Howard graduate, but the second black graduate of the Naval Academy is also from Dunbar High School, and had also been the cadet colonel. So we had a tradition of going to the military schools and competing, and for that reason, I had every confidence that I would be successful. Let's spend a little bit of time with your career there in Annapolis and, and give us some insight about where you found your fun, where you, because you had days of joy. I remember interviewing so many leaders in the civil rights movement, and, and they say that Young people today have the, the misunderstanding that these people who we know as giants in the civil rights movement got up every day and put on their armor and went out to do battle. Uh, there were some fun days. You spent a lot of time laughing uh, in addition to putting on your armor. No. He's shaking no. his head. 
He's shaking his head. Tell us about that. Tell us about <laughs> that four-year period. There weren't very many fun days, I'll assure you. <laughs> Although, uh, I did have a philosophy that said, if today doesn't go right, tomorrow's got to be better. I've been asked several times, did you ever think about quitting? And I said, yes, every single day. But the next morning, I thought more about it and what my goals were and decided that I was going to do better today than I did yesterday. Now, I had friends and I had some other people that were not friends. And it certainly was rough the first semester and the first year, the plebe year, for any number of reasons. But I think you have to look at the fact that hazing or plebe rates or other things that you have to do that physically exhaust you or mentally exhaust you keep you from doing your best academically. And I can certainly understand and sympathize with those who preceded me that they were not stupid, they were smart. And a lot of them, or several of them, were a lot smarter than I was. Uh, Johnson, Sox Johnson, for example, who uh, was there in 1936. Very brilliant guy, built boats, later became um, a marine engineer and naval architect. But when you have so many different things that distract you from studies, your grades have to study, uh, have to uh, 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 suffer. So the combination of poor grades and demerits uh, usually means that you're not going to be successful. Uh, Bob, in his book, reaches the conclusion that I was successful because I was well qualified, but also the timing was right. I was there at the right time. Well, talk, to, talk to us a little bit about that timing. And I think a part of it was, once again, what was going on in America outside the gates in Annapolis. Um, again, this, this relates to the political pressure to integrate the, the Navy. By 1945, with all the uh, revelations coming out about the death camps, uh, racism had gotten a, a bad name, although it was still practiced in the United States. Of course, there was an awful lot of political pressure to integrate the Naval Academy. And the Secretary of the Navy took a personal interest in seeing that that got done. However, uh, he wasn't able to shape the qualifications of those who were appointed. Uh, or he also never gave uh, any midshipman an unfair advantage for political reasons. So by 1945, uh, there was pressure from on high to integrate the Naval Academy. And also, uh, there was interest among the Naval Academy's leadership. The Naval Academy's leadership during James Lee Johnson's tenure, for example, consisted of Southerners who wanted the Naval Academy to remain lily white. And so uh, James Lee Johnson had a hard time from his company officer, battalion officer, the commandant of midshipmen and the superintendent, who all basically looked the other way while uh, white upperclassmen gave James Lee Johnson unfair demerits. In Wes's case, um, not only were there instructions from the Secretary of the Navy, and that's, that's harder to document, but there were instructions from the superintendent, the battalion officer and the commandant, and these are all the, the leaders in the Naval Academy's hierarchy, that, that Wes ought to get fair treatment. However, they were not able to uh, completely eliminate unfair treatment. Back in uh, those days, in the 1940s, all midshipmen marched to class. And if a midshipman was out of step and an upperclassman saw it, uh, this midshipman, this plebe, as freshmen were called, could be written up for marching out of step on the way to class. And this was a, a, a conduct report for which demerits were assigned. And when one received extra demerits, one had to do, or when one received demerits, one had to do extra duty. And this meant marching or rowing a heavy boat instead of studying or relaxing or participating in sports. 
And so uh, Wes received a whole lot of the merits for things that may or may not have happened and most likely did not happen. So that by the end of, uh, actually by probably the late fall of the first semester, he had accumulated over 100 demerits when 300 were needed for expulsion. And it was uh, the same tactic that was used against black midshipmen by white racists at the Naval Academy both in the 1930s and the 1870s. However, during Brown's second semester, he, he only had five demerits. And it wasn't that uh, West suddenly got better, it was that it, there was pressure from these various points in the chain of command to not write him up for things unfairly. Also, Brown had uh, friends at the Naval Academy and supporters. He had supporters among the, the upper class. He had midshipmen in the senior class who were looking out for him, actively trying to prevent this group of midshipmen from succeeding. There was a small group of midshipmen who wanted to run him out and wanted the Naval Academy to remain lily white. One of these midshipmen was the, the son of an Alabama sheriff, so you can imagine the attitudes he brought to his uh, confrontations with Brown. Um, but then there were other midshipmen, both from the North and from the South, in the senior class who wanted Brown to get a level playing field. Uh, one was Joe Flanagan, who was the, the lead midshipman. He was the, the sixth striper, the, the highest ranking midshipman in the senior class and at the whole Naval Academy. Another was a midshipman from Plains, Georgia named Jimmy Carter, who uh, later became President of the United States. He too wanted Brown to have a level playing field. And uh, in various subtle ways, uh, these supporters of Brown managed to stop individuals from harassing him. So between this kind of interaction at the midshipman level and this pressure from the chain of command, Brown got a level playing field by which he was able to succeed or fail on his own merit. And uh, I don't mean to say that he had equal opportunity at the Naval Academy because he didn't. He wasn't allowed to, to sing in the, was it the choir, for example. Um, and there were those midshipmen who would still refuse to sit next to him at the lunch tables, the mess tables, in Bancroft Hall. But uh, he, he wasn't harassed after the first semester the way he was during the first semester by these uh, demerits. As Bob said, there were many people who were friendly and supportive, and plebe summer when I first entered the academy, things were very, very quiet because the upperclassmen were away either on cruise or on vacation. And I began to look around and say, my goodness, uh, am I really in the right place? But when the upperclassmen came back and the plebe rates started, then all hell broke loose. And then it wasn't too a uh, smarter thing to be associated with me or even to talk to me for a number of the youngsters. I don't think they were all prejudiced. I think they were smart enough to realize that if it wasn't important to have a black friend, uh, it was probably more important not to. So there were so many things that you had to learn. A number of the white midshipmen who had attended military school had taken the academic courses book by book, course by course, had all the military training, knew how to take the tests, and were well qualified uh, to get through plebe year. On the other hand, most of my classmates, like me, had served in the armed forces. I enlisted in the Army when I was 17 and went to Howard University under the Army Specialized Training, a program which Army and Navy had to create engineers, doctors, and dentists during World War II and not send everyone off to the Army uh, as uh, soldiers. So I had an excellent background 
in electrical engineering that certainly helped me a, a great deal. Most of my classmates then had come from the military and for the first time many of them did get a chance to see people outside of Plains, Georgia or, or Montgomery, Alabama. I can say that a good friend was Jimmy Carter. If you read the book, if you look at the dust cover, you'll see that he has endorsed the book. I don't know of any other books he's endorsed. And on the uh, first page, there's a quote from him saying that although he grew up in Georgia and he had black friends and they argued and fought and played that he did notice when they became teenagers that there was a difference, uh, there was a uh, uh, deference that his black playmates started showing to him and that it wasn't until he came to the Naval Academy and met me that he was meeting and dealing with a black person on an equal basis. We were on the cross country team together, varsity cross country, and we had a lot of time to talk. And this is one of the Americans that I admire most who's been in American politics. I think he was genuine at age 21, and I think he's also genuine at age 71. Robert, if you would talk and pick up right on that theme, we've talked about the political aspect of appointment to the Naval Academy. Certainly after the Civil Rights Movement, you started to hear an articulation of this notion that a greater diversity at the service academies actually is of benefit to the white mainstream officer corps. They are the ones that benefit from having close personal contact with someone like a Wesley Brown. Because as you said, wherever they came from throughout America, perhaps they did not have any contact with black America. But talk a little bit, because today's young people think of the armed services as one of those places you can go for opportunity, for education, for skilled job training, uh, for advancement. Totally not the world of 1945 America. Talk about the evolution of the political side of appointment to the service academies. And, and once again, against the backdrop of gains in civil rights. Well. Um, I'll, I'll speak strictly to the Naval Academy because that offers a, a window on the rest of society. Uh, between 1949 when West graduated and the class of 1969, an average of three African Americans entered the Academy each year and two graduated. And uh, each class numbered about a thousand, 800 to a thousand. And so uh, it was a period of tokenism more or less. The Naval Academy had no minority recruiting program, uh, certainly not in the 1950s. There was no effort to celebrate diversity uh, in any way, shape, or form. And it wasn't until the Kennedy and Johnson administrations when the civil rights movement really started to pick up the momentum that resulted in the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 65, the Civil Rights Act of 64, that this pressure was put directly on the the Naval Academy to improve. And it was in the summer of 1965, uh, Roy Wilkins, who was head of the NAACP, told President Johnson that he had a, an example right before him that he had just read about in the newspaper of uh, institutionalized discrimination. At that time, at the Naval Academy, there were nine black midshipmen in the summer of 1965 in all four classes. And uh, Wilkins said this is an example of conspicuous discrimination. And so LBJ got on the phone to the Secretary of the Navy and, and said that he wanted the number of blacks at the Naval Academy double. This was in July, August time frame of 65. And LBJ is ordering the Secretary of the Navy to double black enrollment by the fall. Well, the, the Secretary of the Navy called the superintendent into Washington, and they had a conference. Up until that time, the superintendent of the Naval Academy had never given any thought to black issues. Race had not entered his consciousness. There was racially motivated hazing going on at the Naval Academy, but it never reached his attention. 
he was the superintendent, and at the Naval Academy, he was like God. And uh, things never got to that level. And so he had no awareness. Now, when LBJ told him to double the black enrollment by the time classes started, he said he couldn't do that because if he were to bring in nine more black plebes, it would be obvious to the rest that they were brought in because of their race and that problems would arise. But that spurred Kaufman to, uh, Draper Kaufman was the superintendent, uh, that spurred Admiral Kauf Kaufman into thinking about racial issues for the first time. And he actually sort of uh, received mentoring from African American midshipmen about racial issues. And he learned from them, one doesn't say Negro, one says black. Um, his own daughter helped him because uh, Kaufman sponsored a event at his home for some midshipmen who were seniors later on. And one of these seniors happened to be black. And the prospect of uh, this black midshipman who was a first classman at the time having a, a social event in his own home with his daughter being present really made him think. But basically, he went on to become educated uh, about African American issues and race. Uh, and, and the whole Navy did at that time because after 1965, not only was the superintendent of the Naval Academy becoming, to, becoming sensitive to racial issues, but also the chief of naval operations through uh, measures passed by Congress and so forth. And so between 1965 and 1975, the Naval Academy developed a minority recruiting program with uh, minority accessions counselors who went out to recruit in black communities Goals were set for enrollment of African Americans in each class. Um, there was activities started. Um, the gospel choir came later, but uh, uh, black history was being taught at the Naval Academy, started to be taught. The Naval Academy started to hire African American professors. African American officers came to the Naval Academy in leadership roles versus company officers and then as battalion officers during this period. 19 to 1975. Pictures of African-American midshipmen started to appear in the yearbook. If you look at the yearbook in 1968, you might see about three or four pictures with African-American midshipmen in them. By 1978, the lucky bag, as the yearbook is called, had uh, pictures of black midshipmen doing the same things as white midshipmen on almost every page and African-American uh, women were pictured there because they were dates of African-American the, the Naval Academy didn't accept women until 1976. But uh, that's evidence of, of this big turnaround. There was one picture that I find very informative from uh, the Naval Academy yearbook. I believe it was 1960, no, it was a 1970 yearbook. There was a, a group that one of the midshipmen, well, several of the midshipmen called themselves the JGs, and it consisted of eight white musicians and three African Americans and one And uh, uh, the Naval Academy leadership gave them the money they needed to buy instruments, and they became a sponsored activity. And so they became the, the band at, at various social events for midshipmen. And in that picture, among the the singers, one African-American midshipman went on to become a, a general in the Marine Corps. Another went on to become an admiral in the Navy. This is Leo Williams, the general in the Marine Corps. Uh, Tony Watson went on to become an admiral in the Navy. And the third, and his name escapes me right off the top of my head, but he went. Ev Green. No, it wasn't Ev Green. Oh, okay. he, he went on to become uh, a, an Olympic fencer representing the Marine Corps. And so uh, that's right at the middle of the, the period where things were starting to change. And by 1976, you had the first occasion where an African American became the sixth striper, the highest ranking midshipman. Commander Brown, we see the changes. Once again, this is where uh, what happened at the Naval Academy closely parallels what happened in American society. After you graduated in 49, 
we went through a very dark period before we get to 1954. Tell me what your feelings were in terms of your own achievement. Uh, certainly, you had confidence in what you could achieve. You were the master of your ship, your destiny. But in terms of what the legacy would be for your fellow black citizens, for the future of the Navy, what kept you from you know, being despondent that perhaps we couldn't achieve as a nation what you had hoped we could achieve together when you first entered the Naval Academy? Well, I feel that something that happened after World War II that has not received the recognition and credit that it should was the GI Bill. The GI Bill allowed many, many millions of former servicemen to attend college. A lot of Afro-Americans certainly would never have gotten to college without it. These fellows were older, they were serious students, and they had families in many cases. Perhaps there are some baby boomers here because these are the parents of the baby boomers. But I felt that this was a program that helped because going back to World War II, the beginning of World War II, when the Navy would only take volunteers, and then the president decided that they'd set up a manpower commission and allocate uh, the available uh, manpower among civilian priorities and the military and the Navy would receive its share of the numbers that it needed to man the ships. One of the things they found was that a tremendously large percentage of the draftees from the South were illiterate. Having gone through the Depression, many of the Southern school districts didn't feel it was worthwhile to invest money in the education of, ch of uh, black children. But here were these ships that were gonna have to fight the war against the Germans and the Japanese. And the Navy and the Army, but particularly the Navy, had to go into the education business. So from a very humble beginning of illiteracy to learning to read and write in the Navy, to going to college on the GI Bill, we were certainly much better qualified for whatever lay ahead in industry, in government, or even the service academies. Two other things happened too. Service academies changed from a lock stop curriculum with only one choice, languages, and everyone else took the same courses. You ended up with majors, you could select majors, and of course you had to take core courses to prepare you for ordnance and navigation uh, and the Navy uh, professional uh, responsibilities. Uh, having the core course, I mean, having this choice of majors did three things. One, you didn't have to march to, to class. You couldn't because everyone was going in a different direction. This meant you have had less exposure to demerits, talking in ranks uh, or, or being out of step or that type of thing. But it also attracted uh, more people wanted to do something more than just take a, a few Navy courses. It also eliminated the advantages that the schools like Admiral Farragut and uh, uh, other, other prep schools from doing their little uh, program and getting their graduates through the first year by knowing exactly how they were going to be treated at the academy. The other thing which was very important is that the draft ended. So many American young men who came to the academies, uh, Air Force, Navy, Army, Coast Guard, and so forth, who had no interest whatever 
in careers in the military applied and with superior qualifications were accepted rather than some of the others who may have been career oriented. When the draft ended, there was no reason for them to apply. So what we're getting in the services today are volunteers. If you're in and you don't like it, it was your choice. And the draft didn't force you to make this lousy choice, if that's the way you felt about it. And the final thing was, and I think this is important too, to accept women as midshipmen, full, fully uh, competing with the men, and there's nothing like a smart woman to get a Navy officer or enlisted man to start studying for exams, because he doesn't want her to be his boss. And if he doesn't, he's going to show that he's a little smarter and better qualified than she is. So the combination of all of this, I think, is best for what we have now in the Navy. About 25% or more of the midshipmen at the Naval Academy are Afro-American. I'll also say, however, the largest minority group is Hispanic, not black. But for many, many years, it was black. So I feel that the Navy's in good shape now. We have a Washingtonian, Paul Reeson, who is the commander of the Atlantic Fleet with four stars. And we should get a few more four stars before I close my eyes, and I'm looking forward to it. Time and again, as we look back at American history and we see an individual such as yourself at the right time and the right place to achieve goals that inspire others, Certainly you were physically capable, certainly you are mentally capable and prepared, but also so important is the matter of temperament. Where did you find the wherewithal to be as patient, as resilient, uh, as, understand, as focused as you needed to be to not be distracted by all the barriers that were thrown up against you, keep your eye on the prize, and go on through to graduation? Where does that come from? Where did you look to, to replenish that as needed over those four years? I learned a lot from my grandmother, who did not graduate from high school. She was very smart. And there were a few things that she said to me as a kid I never forgotten. I'm sure there are many of you out there who had the same experience growing up. One was, don't worry about things you can't change. Accept them. You're only going to frustrate yourself and not be able to accomplish what you can accomplish. So don't fight City Hall, so to speak. The second thing is, don't make enemies. You can't afford to make enemies. You never know when they can do you in or or do a disservice, okay? You don't have to like everybody, but you can't be obvious in terms of your preferences. And this includes arguing with people who don't agree with you. You're never gonna change them, and they're not gonna change you. So again, these are exercises in frustration. Uh, try to put yourself in the other guy's place and understand why he doesn't like you. There must be something about his growing up or justifying slavery or justifying uh, certain uh, things that uh, are discriminatory. Uh, you feel that there's no argument about it, but the other guy might feel a little differently. And I believe that if you can accept those premises, chances are you'll be able to do your absolute best or not be limited by feeling sorry for yourself. Dr. Schneller, you cover a lot of ground in this book. Tell us about the resource of having a Wesley Brown there to, to be the person whose life you use to navigate us through these waters of a much broader, much wider story, but what his voice 
allows you to do in terms of bringing that story to an audience today? Well, this has been the, the finest project I've had the privilege to work on, and it's, it's largely because of uh, Wes's kindness. Our first interview was in December 1995, and, it, and I had 75 questions to ask, and he answered all of them very patiently, and the interview lasted six hours. And I went, I went on to, to do a total of probably two dozen hours, both on tape and uh, over the phone. I've written uh, topics about Civil War era people, and they're all dead, and you can't call them on the phone. But with uh, Wes, whenever I, I had a question, he, he made it clear to me that I could call on him any time, and that, that was just marvelous. Also, um, oral history gave me a, a window on this experience that no documentary sources could have. Um, the, the demerit campaign that I described earlier, the, the Naval Academy uh, has a, a midshipman service record on each midshipman. And that has the only documentary evidence of any attempt to get Brown. The 105 demerits listed and then the five demerits listed. But as, as far as the dynamics of how that worked, it was all because people told me that, uh, told me about this campaign. Uh, nobody who was involved in it came forward and said I was one of the people who hazed Wesley Brown. Uh, there were a number of people who admitted to not having anything to do with them because they were afraid that the negative, uh, con they were afraid of negative consequences from interacting with him from the people who were trying to run him out. Then there were others who, who didn't care about the negative consequences and interacted with him anyway. Uh, and I heard from some of them. I did hear from three white midshipmen who were seniors at the time Brown was a plebe, and they seemed uncomfortable with the idea of a historian doing a study of this. One accused me of being on a witch hunt. Another said sarcastically, well, here you are writing about the first black Naval Academy graduate. I suppose now you'll go on to write about the first Asian Academy graduate, Indian graduate, and so forth. And um, I imagine these people were among the, the, the group out to get Brown. But I had the privilege of being in contact with uh, Jimmy Carter, Stansfield Turner, and, and several other people who uh, went on to become leaders of this country or, or do great things who crossed paths with Wes Brown at the Naval Academy. So I, I got a, a broad range of oral history resources that, that bring this story to light in a way that no document really can. There's no uh, documentation that I know of that, that describes what it was like to be a plebe at the Naval Academy and, and what it was like to come around to a first classman's room and have to do the number of push-ups corresponding to the, the year in which you were going to graduate. So whenever Wes Brown did something that a senior felt was inappropriate. He had to do 49 push-ups. And wasn't there a joke? You always wondered what the class of 1999 was going to have to do. They, they stopped that number. That, that, that was uh, stopped in the 70s or 80s. In the year old school. Yeah. Uh, but for, for the historian looking at documents uh, and then being able to use oral history, it's, it's like uh, I, I, I feel like Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz going from black and white into color. It, it really breathes life and substance into a story that, that otherwise just couldn't be told. Well, I thank you for telling that story to us. And uh, Commander Brown, I thank you for your courage and the example that you set uh, that still shines to young people today. Uh, looking for some guidance. And I thank you both for your time today, you. and I thank you all for coming and listening to what was an incredible presentation. And uh, thanks again. I'll see you next year. <laughs>